We'll just read the first 11 verses of Acts chapter 5. See, so you've risen. So I take it you found your place. The scripture's here. Read, but a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. He kept back part of the price, his wife, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why does Satan fill thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thy own? And after it was sold, was it not thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Lord, this morning... We thank you for this precious gift of your word that you left to us. Thank you, Lord, for the many things in it which you would teach us, tell us, and for the works that you do inside our own hearts. And so we ask you now to work your work inside us and in our hearts. Help us, Lord, in the hearing of your word, and that as we pay attention to it, that we understand what you would do inside of us and how you would help us and how you would change us, how that you would direct our course, uh, how that you would correct us when we need correcting. And Lord, help us that we would follow you all the way. We ask you these things, Lord Jesus, believing in you, and we ask them in your name. Amen. 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 May be seated. I'd like to preach this morning, and I don't know how well I'll be able to preach. I, I've, I've had a week of uh, some interruptions in the morning and the evening, and it's uh, hindered me, uh, hampered me somewhat. Uh, in that I, I feel like I'm dragging. I'll do my best. But I do have something important to get to you. I'd like to preach to you about half measures this morning. About half measures. If you will, splitting the difference. Uh, going halves with God. I've said often up here that this is an all or nothing gospel. And it is. And, and what I've read to you and you're hearing this morning is about a man and his wife who believe they could get away uh, with their own version of the gospel rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the gospel of Jesus Christ is again all or nothing. Uh, whosoever it be of you that forsaketh not all he hath, he cannot be my disciple. That's what Jesus said. All he hath. Now there was a, a mighty work going on at this time in the church. Uh, and, and there was a, a moving of the Spirit of God in the church. And the church had just gotten together here at the end of chapter 4 after Peter and John were, were persecuted before the council and they'd gotten together and they'd cried out together and prayed together. And by the way, I still believe that a church ought to pray together. Amen. Uh, I believe that it's good for a church to all pray together, out loud, together. Uh, and, and this is what went on in the early church and we cannot deny it. It's here in scriptures and, and let traditions be hanged. Uh, it's good for a church uh, to pray together. Uh, and they all came together uh, and they were praying to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And we preached on this not too many weeks past. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with the boldness of God. And went out the apostles preaching the word and all of those that believed and were added to the church. And a mighty work of God was going on. Now I want to tell you that whenever God's doing something, the devil's doing something. Wherever you see a mighty work of God, there's a, a there's a work of Satan that's going to be going on somewhere. Uh, hope, uh, he's, he's hoping that it's something that's below your eyes, something that's beneath your eyesight, something that you don't see. And oftentimes we don't see. We're carried away and how good it feels for God to work good things, for souls to be saved, uh, and, and for uh, that great feeling of the presence of 
of the Spirit of God, and it is wonderful, but if we're not careful, we'll overlook the fact that the devil does some works too. And he was working while God was working. And I'm going to tell you, just like God will work in your heart, if you're not careful, Satan will work in your heart. You have to be on guard all the time. We're told, watch and pray. Now, what I'm preaching to you this morning about half measures, uh, we like to think that has to deal with sinners coming uh, to Christ. And it does indeed have to do with sinners coming to Christ. As I said, no man can uh, can come to Christ except he forsake all that he had. Uh, we cannot be half saved any more than we can be half born. But it's more than just something to preach to sinners. It's something that's also hateful in the eyes of God uh, for saved and for lost. Half measures. Because we know from what we read that God was not pleased. He was not pleased when Adam and Eve came up with their own version of the gospel when they made themselves aprons of fig leaves, covered themselves, uh, and went and hid in the midst of the trees. He was not pleased when David came up with a way to cover up his own sins uh, and, and sent Uriah out into the heat of battle uh, to be done away with. Uh, and he's not pleased if you or I come up with some other way other than his way. He'll never be pleased with half measures. Now, these half measures himself that Ananias and Sapphira came up with, everybody we read right before in uh, verses, reading the end of chapter 4, pardon me, it says, neither was there, at the beginning of verse 34, neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as, as were possessors, of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of those things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. You'll notice that the ones that possessed land sold everything they had and brought it all and laid it at the feet of the apostles. It said the distribution was made to every man according as he had need, not as according as he wanted to or piped up and said all to have, but as he needed. Uh, and the church may meet some needs of people, uh, but we're not here uh, to meet every desire. It's, uh, certainly a good thing that the church should help people in needs. But uh, here we see that they were doing this in Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which being interpreted as the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, had a land, sold it, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. There's much I can preach there. This is the reason, by the way, when Jerusalem was destroyed, uh, that while most of the Jews lost everything they had, the Christians who were Jews did not. They had already lost it. And, and I'm going to tell you that when everybody else in this land loses everything they have, if you lost it to God a long time ago, you won't lose nothing either. That's right. Amen. If you ever come to the realization that you don't own anything, uh, that it all belongs to God, uh, then you'll also know and realize that you can't lose anything. Because if it ain't yours, you can't lose it. Uh, and if what is in your house is not yours but God's, if the house itself is not yours but God's, and if the car that you drive is not yours but God's, and if the job you work at is not yours but God's, then you can't lose any of it. Amen. Uh, and so they realized this. Everything they had was given unto the gospel. But Ananias and Sapphira had their own version of the gospel. Uh, and they thought that they would go outwardly with all of these that were in the church, but inwardly their own way. Half measures. Half measures. First off, I tell you, they were half committed. They were half, you know, they did give some. It cost them something. It cost them something. And people who go half measures with God, it cost them something. They might have to give up an hour or two on a Sunday. They might have to search in their closet and pick out something they don't like to wear to wear it to church. Amen. Amen. That's a shame. Amen. They might have to uh, bear a little reproach of being called a Christian, but although it cost them something, they're not content to let it cost them everything. Everything. And if you say within yourself, well, it has cost me to serve God. In that, you know, I had to spend my money for a Bible. I had to spend my time to go to church. Uh, I have to 
uh, I have to stay away from these things and those things, and I have to do this, and I have to do that, and I've done this, and I've done that, I remind you that you've done nothing. At the end of the day, you're still an unprofitable servant. At the end of the day, if you've not given it all to God, it's still half measures, and God not only is not, He's not half pleased with it, He's completely disgusted with it. Anything that's less than everything is nothing. Anything, let me say that again. Anything less than everything is nothing. If you've not given everything to God, you've given nothing to God. Half measures have always been abominable in the sight of God. They've always been hateful in the sight of God. And if He calls Ananias and Sapphira to die over it, how can we think He's pleased with us over it? They were half committed. They held back on their earthly wealth. 10% fine for them poor folks, but I make too much money to give 10%. I've actually heard that before. Uh, I had a landlady one time who gave her, her boy had joined the church. I don't think she was very happy about that. This was before I was a Christian. And he was a doctor. And she advised him, you don't have to give 10%. That's way too much money. Just give $100. Well, $100 is 10% if you make $1,000. I think that math's right. Uh, but given to the church, first off, if you're a Christian, 10% is a little gift. And if, if that's all you can do, you give the waitress more than you give, more than you give God. Amen. Uh, if you give a 15% uh, tip, I don't think you ought to tithe less than 15%. Amen. Amen. You're quiet this morning. Right. I believe you ought to give and not just tip God. I, I believe you ought to give. What, and, and as a matter of fact, I think you ought to stretch yourself out when you're giving uh, I, I think you ought to stretch your limits with your giving. You'll find out if you do uh, that God will enable you to give more. I don't mean He'll enable you to have more to blow on your own self and give you uh, stuff just to waste, but the more you give, the more God will help you be able to give. I believe in that. Yes, it does. But if you won't trust God, and if you got to hold back because I can't afford paying your tithes this week, preacher, I've got, I, I just can't afford to this week, don't you worry about it. God will take care of it. Uh, but you're not going to like the way He does it. Giving less than everything is giving nothing. They held back on the well. Apparently they didn't trust God. I remember there was a rich young ruler one time. They come running and kneeling and speaking to Christ and speaking honorably to Him until, until Jesus told him, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And he went away sorrowful. He just couldn't do it. Just couldn't let go of the earthly stuff. Right. right. But I'll tell you, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you'll give it all up. At the time that I got saved, at the time that I got saved, I remember things trying to come across my mind about things that I owned and, and guns and guitars and tools. But I, I knew in my mind I'd already given them away. Do you know later on, when the robbers and the thieves come and they stole from me guns and guitars and tools. Although I, I hated it. I hated it for what they'd done to their own soul. And I hated to lose some things that were sentimental. I had already lost those things. See, I'd already given them up. In my own heart, I'd already given them up to God. And all I could say was, Lord, they stole you. They stole all of your property. I'm telling you, in your heart, if you are holding on, the things and stuff and wealth of this earth that you're committing a grave sin against God, that you are going half measures with God. And we cannot have anything on this earth above God. We cannot have this earth and that earth. But if we're to serve Him, we must serve Him all the way. For I remind you that although Ananias and Sapphira tried to go half measures with God, that God did not go half measures with them. But Jesus, it says in the book of, of Philippians in chapter 2, says, Paul said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you about the mind that was in Christ Jesus. He said, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but, but, 
made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus held back nothing and kept back nothing from Ananias and Sapphira. And he held back nothing from you. But he gave up more than you ever thought you gave up. What if you gave up? A dollar bill somewhere? A hundred dollar bill somewhere? What if? What if? The God of heaven said, give up your house, give up your car, wrap yourself in a bag, get out on the streets and give it all up. It still wouldn't add up to what he gave up. You still would not have given what he gave. What if he told you that you had to spend the rest of your life in poverty going out and telling people about him? Oh, it still would not add up to what he did for you. You've given nothing compared to what he gave for you. Don't tell me about financial sacrifices. Neither you nor I have given up what Christ gave up. He gave up the wealth of heaven. What have we given up? The wealth of this world? What's that? It's ashes. Dust and ashes. We've given nothing. And to hold on to a handful of dust and ashes and to look at the Prince of Glory and say I'm not giving up anything do you not understand is a grievous sin against a holy God they were half committed and I tell you also they were half obedient half obedient perhaps those of you in here who have raised children can understand thinking about your own children. How if you told them to clean up their room and they cleaned up half their room, in their minds, they've got that justified, don't they? Doesn't a child have it justified everything that they do and don't do? Have you ever seen a child without an excuse? I've never seen them. Every child has an excuse for everything they didn't do. But let me ask you this, if you, asked them, if you told them, to clean up the room and they clean up half, were they obedient or disobedient? And if God has instructed you and I and we've done half of what he said, are we obedient or disobedient? I tell you, we're disobedient. I tell you that we're not half good. We're all the way wicked if we will not do what God says. And if we know what he says and we will not do it, we are not in submission and we are not obedient. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He never said anything about half my commandments. He never even said anything about most of my commandments. He never said anything about the ones that you like keeping. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That means that if we're obedient to him, we can't have a secret or a private life away from church. <clears throat> Can I tell you something this morning? If you walk a good walk in here, but it ain't the walk you walk out there, God's not happy with it. As a matter of fact, He's angry with it. If you will cover your nakedness in here, but you won't cover it out there, you're a hypocrite and a disgrace to the name of Christ. What you'll live has to be lived all the time. The Christian life is not lived in a church building. It's lived 24 hours a day everywhere you are. If you'll tell a dirty joke at the water fountain at work, it's just as disgraceful as if you come up here and told it in front of the congregation. Half measures are half measures. And being half obedient is being fully disobedient. Whatever God has commanded is commanded for all times. <clears throat> now remember, besides not having a secret or private life, by the way, y'all not have two dress codes either since I'm here on that. Y'all not have two manners of dressing. But what's right is right all the time. Yes. 
Amen. That also means you shouldn't shy away from a known duty. <clears throat> if you know it's your duty, it's your duty. I remember times when I was in the Marine Corps where I had plans for one of my days off. Pardon me. <clears throat> and then things would come along and I would be assigned to duty. Now I hadn't been, I hadn't planned on that, but it came along. Now at that point, if I ignored that duty and said I had plans, I would be disobedient and I would pay the price. But having been told my duty, now I had to change my plans. And maybe you've had ways and things that you like to do and the way you live. And then one day in the preaching of the word, something came up and you saw that something about the way that you looked and lived and acted was wrong. Now your plans have been changed and your duty has been changed. And if you go about living like you were living and saying it's the way I always live, you'd be just as negligent of your duty as I would have been if I would have ignored the duty that was assigned me and went about the plans I had anyhow. You see, once we know what our duty is, once we know what the Word of God tells us, it is no longer an option to us, but it is a duty. And any disobedience to it is rank sin and is hateful to God. That's why James says what he says uh, in the book of James in chapter 4, when he says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Uh, and so, if we then having the instruction of God, refuse to do all of it, we're just as guilty as Ananias and Sapphira, who held back part of the price. For we must pay the full price of duty and follow all of his commandments. And if we know it's in scriptures, we can't say, well, I'm a Baptist, I don't have to do that. I'm a Pentecostal, I don't have to do that. I'm a Methodist, they do that down to the other church. None of that is acceptable in the eyes of God. But there is one word of God, one Bible, and when he's given it to us, and we've heard it, it is our duty to do the commands of God. Amen. Amen. Half obedience is fully disobedient. And when we know that we ought to follow the will of God, and we follow most of it, we're wicked in the eyes of God. For God not only does it like half obedience, but when God himself in the flesh, Jesus himself, came down, he was obedient all the way. He said, I do always, always the will of my Father who sent me. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. That wasn't just for Jesus. That's for the followers of Jesus. That's for the disciples of Jesus. That's for Christians to pray. Not by will, but thine be done. If it means I've got to go through my room again and clean out more stuff again, so be it. If it means I've got to change my ways again, so be it. For I must be fully obedient to Christ. They were half committed Half obedient. The last thing I've got for you this morning, pardon me. They were half deceived. Half deceived. You know, they deceived others. I think they did. They laid down that before the church. It wasn't the whole church that said anything. I think they probably fooled some people. And I don't know, maybe you're fooling some people. Or maybe you think you are. Well, it was all over with the whole church knew. And maybe you think you're fooling people in your house. You probably ain't, but maybe you think you are. You know, I think they did deceive themselves. Little Jack Horner sat in a corner eating his pudding and pie. Stuck in his thumb, he pulled out a plum. Said, what a good boy am I. I think sometimes we're like little Jack Horner. And just sitting there convincing ourselves that we're just good people. Boy, we're the stuff. Boy, God, God sure got to be happy with us. 
Ain't we something? You know, we're the salt to the earth. We're, we're the ones that keep this community going. What a good boy am I. But I tell you, we better be careful we're not deceiving ourselves. That's right. I believe Ananias and Sapphira deceived themselves. They had half obeyed God and not obeyed Him. Half committed to God and not fully committed to God. And they were given over to deception. How do I say that? Because look what Peter said. Ananias, why have Satan filled thine heart? Filled means full. They've been deceived by Satan. I believe before you can deceive yourself, before you can get to the point where you think you're all right when you're not, you've already went half with God. You've already tried to split the difference. You've already went half measures and laid back and held back on God. And I believe if you do it, that God can you give you over to being deceived. Yes. And there's great danger in this. We can half do long enough we get used to it. We can half do so long we start thinking it's, it's, it's all we have to do. And we can half do so long that God will let us be filled with the wrong spirit. But I remind you that God was not deceived. Furthermore, God's man was not deceived. Peter didn't know this because Peter was high and holy. He knew it because God was high and holy. And the spirit of a high and holy God was in him. He knew it because God told him. And by the way, if you're corrected on any of this, it'll probably be because God uses somebody. It may be a preacher. It may be somebody in your house. It may be a good friend of yours. It may be a stranger. But if you're corrected, on giving half measures to God, it'll probably be because God tells somebody to tell you something. And if they do, if they do, listen to me, if they do, you better not cover it up. Peter asked Ananias. Well, Peter confronted Ananias. But when Ananias laid it down, he told his lie. But Peter asked Sapphira, you put it to him, did you sell this for this much? She had the option of coming clean. But when she held on to it and covered it up, it was too late for her to. By the way, did you notice? It doesn't tell how much they held back. Apparently, it don't matter. Apparently, you don't have to go exactly mathematically half for it to be half measured. I tell you, if you go most of the way with God, it ain't no better than going halfway. Demas went so far as to follow Paul around on his, on his journeys for a while before he quit on him. But when he quit, guess what he was? He was quitting. Don't matter if you quit at the first or the last, you're quitting. And if you won't bring it all to God, it don't matter if you bring nine-tenths or if you bring 95%. If you're giving 99% to God, you're a hypocrite and a liar, and you haven't given it all to God. It's still half measures. And it's what God's had on my heart this morning. And it's a pretty tough thing to deal with. Because before I can deal with this, with you, I've got to deal with this with me. And I've been struggling with this all of yesterday and into today. But now it's before you. And it's yours. And I don't know what you're going to do with it. But I tell you, I want you to do the same thing that I want me to do. And that's get right with God. And get real with God. And say, Lord, wherever I've deceived myself, please undeceive me. Show me where I've held anything back from you. Show me if I'm living two standards. Show me if I'm living two lives. Show me if I've held back on the cost. And let me get it right. Brother Craig, I'm going to ask you to come forward with a song. The altars are yours if you need them, if you need front people.